telling you a bit about the journey I've been on uh, for the last 20 years. Um, it's a very personal journey. It might not apply to anyone else, but it, it, it's what I've done. Um, and uh, it, it really started, uh, well, over 20 years ago. I, I originally um, had, I have a degree in physics and electronics, so I was sort of a scientist engineer. Um, and came out of university, Southampton University, with a 2-1, much to my tutor's surprise, um, and had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, but that, sort of like many journeys, so I started out not really knowing where I was going. Um, so I decided that um, I would go to the library and do some research. And I, I like a good engineer, I, I made a list of the requirements um, that I had for a job. And uh, so my requirements were really quite simple. I wanted to earn a lot of money, I wanted to have a lot of holiday, uh, I wanted some travel, I wanted an exciting job. You know, it wasn't too difficult. And I looked through a book, in those days we had books, and um, I actually came up with about five companies that would fulfill all of those criteria. Um, and they were all, yeah, really, uh, they were all in the, um, the oil industry. Um, and I wrote to a couple of them, uh, one was Schlumberger, you've probably heard of, another one was Seidengraf Service, who were a seismic company. And uh, I had a very interesting interview um, with Seismograph. The guy who interviewed me was clearly a, a very, very smart individual. He asked me a few questions and he said, well, if you start next week, you will get your first skiing in November. And so he, he obviously had me sussed. And two weeks later, I found myself on a uh, twin-engined otter, I think it was called, a, a plane, flying into the Libyan Sahara Desert. And I spent the next two years in this place. With that, that was our equipment truck um, in, in the Libyan Sahara Desert. Um, in fact, for the first 18 months, that, this is after I was promoted to be a proper engineer. For the first 18 months, I was the explosives expert. I, I spent my life wandering around the desert, blowing it up, basically. <laughs> um, which, you know, as a 21-year-old or whatever I was then, yeah, it was actually amazing, because we worked 10 weeks on and then had four weeks off. So, brilliant. But during the 10, work, 10 weeks we worked, we really worked. We worked seven days, a, seven days a week, you know, 12 hours a day. But in that desert, there is nothing else to do. So it wasn't a problem. And at the end of 10 weeks, you were kind of starting to get, go a bit funny. They would say, where do you want to fly? And you'd go, oh, I'll fly to Rome and they'd give you a ticket, and off you'd go. And all you had to do was get back four weeks later. In fact, I never actually succeeded in getting back four weeks later. I was always a day late, which became a bit of a joke in my camp. But anyway, so I did that for two years. Um, but clearly, it's not a great career. Um, and towards the end of two years, I, I realized that I, I had to kind of maybe do something a little bit more serious. I was under pressure from my parents, as you can imagine. Um, and so I, I resigned, came back to Europe, um, again, not really knowing what I was going to do. So I did the only possible thing that I could have done in those circumstances, and I, oh, and I became a ski instructor. <laughs> um, and I worked in the French Alps um, for, for a season, and while I was there, I kind of did some more research about how I could um, move my career on, shall we say, because again, being a ski instructor is great fun for winter, but you know, maybe today would be all right, but uh, it's not long term. And um, I then realized I had to sort of take a new, new track um, for my career, and um, I applied to a, a great school in France, in Fontainebleau, called INSEAD, to do an MBA. And amazingly enough, thanks to my 2-1, and thanks to some fairly creative writing, and I've always been good at creative writing, they actually accepted me. And I ended up in this place, in Seattle, in Fontainebleau, um, to do an MBA. So a sort of a complete change from being a scientist engineer to being a business person, I guess. And I had a fantastic year. Um, you, know, you, you, you cover everything from marketing, accounting, finance, uh, Everest, organizational behavior, really, really interesting year. And more than that, it was a year where I suddenly realized that um, I, w I was quite multicultural. Um, and in INSEAD, there are like 
30 or 40 different nationalities, and they force you to work together. In fact, they put you in groups which are designed to be have sort of maximum um, divisive groups, if you like. So I, I was in a group, because you, you actually get marked um, as a group, and I was in a group with another Englishman, um, a, a Lebanese, an Israeli, an American. You can imagine, I mean, the, the, the group work was incredible to, to, to get done, and you had to get it done as a group. So, brilliant year, um, and came out of that, and I was headhunted out of that, finally, sort of serious career. I was headhunted into a chemical company called Courtauld's, um, which was a very traditional British chemical company. Um, it had two parts to it, fibres and chemicals, and then they, it split up. And in the chemicals part, one major part um, was paint, industrial paint, really. And um, I ended up working in industrial paint. I started off in a commercial role and then went more into marketing roles um, and then ended up working in head office. I actually, uh, I lasted 13 years in Courtauld's. Um, uh, a very interesting time because basically over those 13 years they managed to destroy about two billion pounds worth of value. Um, it was very badly run but in many ways I learned more from seeing them run it badly um, than maybe I'd learned if it had been brilliantly run. But I ended up in, um, in head office in, uh, sort of in, in business development, which is a sort of a classic MBA job, sort of advising the board, going off and doing uh, mergers and acquisitions. Um, and actually, I became a specialist in selling businesses because they kept having to sell businesses off in order to have money to survive, which is not a great way to run a business. Um, and uh, finally ended up buying a business in Germany, uh, a wonderful German uh, family business, Mittelstand business. Um, and as I, I was the, well, there were actually two of us in head office who spoke German. There was myself and there was the chairman. So guess who was chosen to go out and help run the business? Not the chairman. So I went out to Germany um, and ran or helped to run a, a big paint company in Germany. Um, for a couple of years. Quite a very interesting time, you know, living as an expatriate. We had three young children, um, but expatriate life has its advantages and we had a really great time. Uh, a few mishaps, so we managed to uh, have an explosion in those two years, in, in, in the two years I was in Germany. We, we got over that. Um, and then finally got to a point where my eldest child was just coming up to school age and uh, we, did, we decided that we didn't really want them to go uh, through the German school system. It, it just didn't quite fit our philosophy. I won't go into detail. Um, and we were thinking of coming back to, uh, to London. And uh, at that point, um, it was one of those moments in your life that sort of something happens and you think, wow, you know, do you go right or you go left? And uh, so... That's a phone, telephone, I guess, uh, probably quite a few people in this audience who recognise that, <laughs> because a lot of audiences have, I talk to have no idea what that is. Um, and a friend of mine from NCAD, one of, uh, he's actually American, uh, uh, who'd been working as a venture capitalist for, uh, for 13 years, we had been talking for a long time about coffee, and why there was no coffee in the UK. So I was partly brought up in, in Germany, in France, in Austria, and I had seen the coffee culture, if you like, of those countries, which is, you know, in, in the case of Austria, has been going for hundreds of years, very, very strong uh, coffee culture, wonderful coffee houses that you know, we used to hang around in. And he was American, and he had seen the Starbucks phenomena in America, you know, which just came out of nowhere. And even 20 years ago, with, you know, they, they, they already had a few thousand Starbucks, I guess, by then. But we could never understand why there were no coffee bars in, 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 in the UK. And we'd been talking about this, and finally, at this point in time, he had found five small coffee bars which were for sale. <coughs> they, they were all in London, and they were called Cafe Nero. Um, they weren't very good. They had good coffee, but the rest of it was a bit iffy. Um, and he, he decided, it was a bunch of friends, we would buy these five coffee bars. Um, and that's what we did. In 1997, we bought five uh, small coffee bars in London. Um, and I think there were 35 employees. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, it, 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 it was branded. Well, it, it had a name, Cafe Nero. It wasn't really branded. You can imagine it was a very small company. 
Um, so he rang me up and said, could I help build um, this coffee bar, which we've been the dream we'd been talking about, to which I replied, but you can't pay me, can you? And he said, no, of course not. You know, it's a tiny, tiny company. Um, but, you know, we could find a little bit maybe. Come over, and I think he asked me in the end to do 12 weeks because I said, I have to get a serious job. I've got three kids. We're going to get a mortgage. You know, I, I, I can't do it. But anyway, in, in the end, I agreed to, um, to spend, I think, 12 weeks helping sort of do a turnaround on this sort of business, which had been pretty badly run for many years. And uh, we came over in 19... 98, and uh, in fact, just before we came over, I managed to find another job um, as a uh, chief executive of a chemical company in the UK. Um, but I told them that I couldn't join immediately. I, I needed a few months to, to help a friend sort of turn his coffee bar around. So we came back to the UK, and I started working in, in, in these little coffee bars, having a lot of fun. And then one day a week, I would actually then work as a consultant in the chemical company where I was due to go in as CEO. Um, and this, went actually, this actually went on for about, I think, about four months before um, the owner of the chemical company said, you know, Paul, you've got to join now. You know, you've got a contract. You, you, we, we need a chief executive, you're going to have to come and join. So on the 2nd of January 1999, I, 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 I left Café Nero, and I, he picked me up in his Aston Martin, this was the owner of the company, um, and he drove me to, to the company for my first day in the office. Um, and we had a kind of classic first day, I was taken around, I met all the, all, all, all the managers, I met the... the shop floor with all the workers, we looked at the numbers, we looked at the order books, we went through the whole thing, I had a great day, and at the end of the day, um, he said, well, you know, I was standing in his office, and he said, what do you think? And I said, well, I think you're in real trouble, actually, you're going to go bust if you don't do something pretty drastic, because it was obvious, he was, they were doing really badly, and he, kind of, he said, wow, you know, really? I go, yeah, absolutely, you're going to have to make... You know, look at the numbers. You're going to have to make a third of your workforce redundant. The, the order books were pretty empty. You know, they, they just had far too many people. And he said, wow, I guess, yeah, you're right. I have to do that. And then I said, and I'm one of them. So I made myself redundant on the first day in my job. It was obvious he couldn't afford to pay me you know, a big salary. Um, but he accepted it. In fact, he, he afterwards he thanked me for having sort of been direct about it and uh, so I, I went home that night and my wife said did you have a good day in the office <laughs> first day in the office I said well it was quite interesting actually I had to make a third of the workforce redundant um, and she said well that's terrible you know like, what a terrible way to start your new, you know your new job and I said well that's not the worst of it <laughs> and she said what do you mean I said well I'm afraid I'm one of them at which point you know she went mad because she realized you know, I just love working in the coffee bar. <laughs> <laughs> I have two hobbies, I should point out at this stage. Um, one is food, which is why my friend from INSEAD had rung me up, because I was the only MBA he knew who knew anything about food. So that's really how I got the job. Um, and the other hobby I have, other passion, is music, which you'll hear about a bit later. So those are the two things I do. So the next day I was back in Cafe Nero, um, and, uh, and I'm still there. <laughs> so that, that's how it started. And, and uh, we then started to build um, more coffee bars. We built the num number six, I think, we built towards the end of 1998. Um, and we just kept going. I mean, it, it wasn't simple. Um, there it is. Um, now, th this is not what it looked like in the early days. This is already, this was about number... I would say that's about number 15. <coughs> but in the early days, um, you know, it had no brand. We, we came up with, a, with the logo. We came up with the colours. We, we did everything. I mean, and it was great fun. There were four of us who, 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 who were running it, really. There was one guy, um, there was my friend, um, who, who was sort of chairman and strategy and, you know, that's that, that part of it. I looked after all the food, beverage, buying and distribution. 
Uh, another guy with finance director, he also did property. And the fourth guy, in fact, the fourth guy is the only guy who really knew what he was doing. He had been running the five coffee bars. So we made him operations director because he's the only guy who really knew what he was doing. And he ran the day-to-day -day operations. Um, but we had a fantastic <coughs> time. Um, uh, it was really exciting. Uh, not easy. Even in those days, uh, we had competition. In fact, there was a fourth competitor. Anyone remember who, who that was? There was a company called Coffee Republic who um, were quite powerful. I mean, when we started, they were, you know, they, 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 were, well, they were a lot bigger than us. Um, but they got it wrong. They made some very bad decisions in terms of um, acquiring sites. And they overextended themselves. They were publicly listed. And in the end, we, we took them out, effectively. We bought 11% of them. Um, and then when they were desperate, we swapped that 11% for some of their best sites, which is not a great strategy for a coffee bar. And that really was the end of them. So, we, but, you know, very, very strong competition. In fact, when we started um, with our five coffee bars, Starbucks didn't, <coughs> didn't exist. Um, and I think by the middle, by the mid-99, we'd, we'd built about three or four more. And we woke up one day to read Starbucks had bought Seattle Coffee who were actually the biggest in London. They had 50 stores in London. So overnight, you know, we suddenly had this sort of giant competitor uh, breathing down our necks, which was, you know, quite, quite worrying, as you can imagine. But actually, um, it actually helped us because they came in, massive publicity machine, huge PR machine. Um, I actually gate-crashed their first opening <laughs> and met their PR company. They ended up working for us. Um, so we kind of, we were the small players. We were ducking, weaving, and diving. We had no money. We kept running out of money. Um, so what happens in retail game is that, unfortunately, you have to pay your rent every quarter, every three months. You have to pay your rent, which is why, at the moment, and for the next few weeks, you're going to be hearing about more retailers, not just Maplin, not just Toys R Us, there's going to be quite a few more, I'm afraid, in the next few weeks who are going to declare themselves out of business because they have to pay their rent at the end of March. And many of them, you know, quite a few will not be able to. Um, and we went through the same thing. I mean, we got to the end of the quarter, we had no money, we would sit around the board table and go, what do we do? And I would be ringing up friends and saying, can you, can you invest £100,000 in Café Nero um, on Monday? Um, and, and one or two of them did. I mean, that was the amazing thing. I mean, we, we kept kind of peering over the edge of the cliff, and then, you know, suddenly a friend would come along and go, yeah, I'll do that. I think this is great. And, you know, they've actually done really well out of it. They made a lot of money. But it, it was touch and go for uh, two or three years. Everyone said we were mad. Um, you can imagine, everyone said, it's a fad, it's a fashion, <coughs> you know, you wait another year, it'll be done, it'll be finished, you know, you'll, they'll, people will be on to the next big thing. And we didn't believe it. I mean, we, we, we thought that this was a culture, this was actually going to be a shift in the culture of this country. Um, and that's exactly what happened. And this was all around the time that people obviously were traveling a lot more, people suddenly discovering what good coffee was. And there was this enormous cultural shift, not just in the way people, uh, people's expectations of, of coffee and coffee houses, but in the way people uh, worked um, and were working in Cafe Nero's. No one would have believed that 20 years ago. You know, people, all these people doing their work inside a coffee bar. But, um, you know, the internet, obviously, uh, Wi-Fi, everything has allowed coffee bars to, to develop in the way that they have now become a, you know, no one, I don't think, would question whether we're going to survive or not. You know, coffee is here forever now in this country, which is great. Um, if you look at our numbers, um, pretty phenomenal growth. I mean, this is up to 2011, where we were turning over about 165 million um, from zero in 98, pretty well. Um, phenomenal growth. And what happened is that in 2001, um, when we had about 58 shops, we, 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 we were fed up of ringing our friends and family for money. 
and begging. And we, uh, we decided we had to get serious about it and we floated on the London stock market. We raised nine million pounds, um, uh, all of which then went into building new shops. Um, and then what happened is over the next few years, we ended up regretting being a public company because there are enormous constraints upon you as a public company. You, you obviously have to tell the city about what you're doing. You have to um, justify everything. You know, you're constantly talking to um, investors. Um, and we wanted to become an international company quite quickly. And, and the city didn't really want us to become an international company. They were putting constraints upon us. And by 2007, um, the, chair, the chairman, Jerry, my friend, was so fed up of being a public company that we decided to buy it back which is what we did. We, we did a sort of leverage buyout. We borrowed a couple of hundred million pounds and we borrowed it back. Um, so it's now back in private ownership, in fact. Um, there's probably, I don't know how many in, uh, shareholders there are now, about 20, 30. Um, and in fact, this curve, amazing curve, carried on. And uh, this year will probably turn over about 350 million. Um, and, and we're very successful. Now, before anyone says, well, why don't you pay tax? Um, because that's always the uh, criticism that uh, is thrown at us. Though, when you go out and borrow a couple of hundred million pounds, unfortunately you have to pay interest and you, you pay a huge amount of interest. So um, our profits over the last few years have really all gone into paying off that interest. But we control the business and we now have far more freedom in what we can do with it. Um, and unfortunately in the next few years we are going to start paying quite a lot of tax, but that's just part of being successful. And then um, yeah, so in 2007, uh, we, we bought it back, which is a, what they call a liquidity event. Um, and by that time, you know, I'd, I'd been there nearly 10 years. I was pretty burnt out. And uh, I decided that I'd really had enough. I never wanted to look at another panini in my life. <laughs> that's, what, that's the truth. And I went to my chairman and I said, I'm out of here. You know, I've done my bit, we've built the business up, but now, you know, I can sell my shares, my, my options are all vesting, and uh, it's, it, it's time for me to go off and do something else. Um, and he said, no, you can't leave, <laughs> which is an interesting response. I, <coughs> he, said, so he said, what do you want to do? Um, so I, I, I said, well, I will, um, I'll do international development, because that's kind of fun. And we had just done our first uh, joint venture in Turkey, um, and that's like building a new Cafe Nero all over again. Every country is, is, is very exciting. So I said I'd do that. And he was very happy about that. And then I, I said I would uh, carry on building the music program. As I mentioned earlier, music's my big thing. And I had developed quite a big music program where we, we not only play music in all the stores, but a lot of the music we play is from unsigned artists. Um, people I've got to know, uh, musicians I've got to know. And we not only play their music in store, but we put on live gigs. This year we'll probably put on about 500 live gigs around the country in Cafe Nero. Um, and we sponsor <coughs> music festivals. Um, and we run music competitions. So I have a lot of fun. And I was already building that up then. So I said I, was gonna ca I would carry that on, of course. And uh, he was very happy about that. And then I said to him, and I'm going to work two days a week. <laughs> and he wasn't so happy about that, funny enough. But in the end, he realized that you know, I would have gone. If, if he'd have said no, I, I would have gone. So he said, yeah, that's fine. Um, so that's, since then, that's what I've been doing. Um, in fact, I've now given up most of my international work, which has left me with music, which is fantastic. Um, that's a picture of me looking happy after we brought it back. <laughs> um, and one of the things that we did, uh, well, one of the things I was working on then was the notion that you know, coffee bars are really community gathering spaces. I mean, they're places, in a way, we don't sell coffee. What we do is we rent a bit of space for someone to come in and relax or to work or do whatever they want to do. And at the same time, they happen to buy a coffee. But really, it's about the space and about the community and, and that sort of gathering. And, uh, and in fact, in a lot of towns around the country, you know, we're a really important part of the local community, um, an absolutely essential part. And I was kind of working on this idea of maybe you've got this sort of real world community, maybe 
the internet could be used to create virtual communities. I was starting to work on that idea. And I created a company um, because I had time on my hands, because I was only working two days a week, um, called meetmeforacoffee.com. Um, which was the idea which you would join your local coffee bar and then you could see who else was in your local coffee bar. Um, great idea, completely disastrous. Uh, we got it so wrong. You know, we, we went through three iterations of, of, of the website. None of them worked properly. Uh, we really didn't know what we were doing. But we had a lot of... We were, I was doing it with one other guy, a journalist. Um, we, we had a lot of fun trying to do it. And then while I was doing that, I met a team who were doing exactly the same thing um, but did know what they were doing, um, and we joined forces. That was called uh, Street Life. Um, and I spent the next few years um, building up Street Life um, as a sort of a community. Does anyone remember Street Life? A couple here, okay. I mean, we ended up with one and a half million users, which is not bad. Um, and it was all about talking to your neighbours, about, you know, you would join and you'd, you'd put your postcode on, and then you could find out what was going on in your neighbourhood, and people would, you know, would talk about, do you know a good plumber? I've lost my cat. Um, a million and one things that people talk about, you know, as it were, to the neighbours. And, and it was really, really active, uh, very engaged audience, and we built it up to about a million and a half people. But in the end... Um, well, actually, I'll, oh, that, that's me with my, one, of my, one of my music festivals. Yeah, we, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Great band. Um, so, yeah, we took it from, in 2013, 100,000 users up to 1.1 million users. Um, and, uh, yeah, a, a, a really great network. But um, we made one big mistake, is that our cash, uh, cash burn got bigger and bigger, as we got bigger and bigger. And we were what was called pre-revenue. We never had any income at all, um, which is quite normal in social networking. And it's fine if you've got backers with really deep pockets, but we, we didn't have backers with re really deep pockets. And unfortunately, we got to a point, we, we actually got up to about one and a half million users where we made the, the, the cardinal mistake, uh, the sin we made was we, we effectively ran out of money. And uh, we were forced to, um, to sell it, which we, luckily, very, very luckily, um, we sold it um, early last year to the Americans came charging over the hill um, with a reasonable amount of money and they bought it from us. Um, so, you know, that had been taking up about two days of my week. So I've been two days at Cafe Nero, two days doing um, street life um, and, and building that up. And then suddenly overnight, I had nothing to do. Yeah. Um, which was a bit of a shock, and it was a shame, because we actually believed we were going to be the next Facebook. I was already thinking about spending the money we were going to make. Um, <laughs> sadly, you know, we, we, we sold it, which was in itself remarkable, um, but it, it wasn't a great, you know, I'm not going to pretend it was a massive success for the, for the investors, but, but we got something back, which was good. Um, and uh, so then, what do, we, what do you do? Um, I was left with still doing uh, Cafe Nero. Obviously, by then, we'd grown and grown and grown, but I was doing mainly music. Um, and I'd started doing a bit of um, tech investing as an angel investor. Um, and I sat on a few tech boards, which was very interesting, but um, didn't kind of keep me out of trouble, uh, really. And I was looking for something else to do. And about that time, I thought, well, maybe it's quite fun to do something in the music industry. Um, and a number of amazing coincidences happened, which I'll talk about. Um, so my third career. Yeah, so I've now been, actually, it's kind of, street life was hardly a career. It was a sort of an interlude, I guess. But um, what happened is I, in fact, at, at a Cafe Nero, or a, a Cafe Nero event, I met a guy, this is this crazy guy up there, called Ray Jones, who, who was running Time Out. Um, and he, he was running all the live events for Time Out. And we got chatting. He also supported a lot of unsigned artists through the Time Out events. Um, and he, he loved doing, very passionate about music, very passionate about supporting music. And we got chatting, and we were kind of talking about the way that the music industry in this country has really 
not moved on a lot over the last 20 years. Um, and uh, we, we, we really need to do something different. At the same time, a friend of mine, can't remember how I met her, great network. She introduced me to the guy at the top right. Um, that, his name is Mervyn Davis. In fact, to give him his full title, is Lord Mervyn Davis. And um, he came to my office to talk in Cafe Nero to talk about just being, doing business, doing, uh, it was just a kind of a general chat, but we got on really well. And it transpired that he also loved music. Um, and he, he then went away and he invited me to a party uh, a few weeks later. He, he's chairman, he, he was a minister of trade in the Labour government and he, he was a, uh, he was the chairman of Standard Chartered Bank, um, and he sits on many boards. He, he, he's what they call a heavy hitter. And he invited me to a fundraising party at, um, at the Royal Academy. He's actually chairman of the uh, fundraising at the Royal Academy, which is really the great and the good of this country. Very, very wealthy people. So he invited me to a party. It was actually a fundraising party at the Royal Academy. I worked out at this party <coughs> that I was the poorest guy there by a factor of 100. Right. And I'm not that poor, but absolutely extraordinary party. And he had invited, as the, the music, there were musicians everywhere, you know, playing on every corner there was music playing. So the main musician playing was this guy here, who recognises him? Jamie Cullum. Yeah, that's Jamie Cullum. Brilliant, brilliant musician, great artist. And Jamie was invited to entertain 400 of us at this private party. And Jamie was on stage playing piano halfway through the evening. We'd all had a few drinks, I have to admit. And he said, right, who's gonna get up on stage and play with me? And I stuck my hand up. And he, <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll do that. So I ended up on stage with Jamie Cullum. He said I could play three notes, right? And he gave me the three notes to play. And I said, yeah, that's fine. And then he started to play kind of left hand jazz bass. What he didn't know is that I am actually a jazz musician. Not a great jazz, but not a bad jazz musician. And uh, so I played those three notes. He said, that's fine, you know, carry on. And then I started going into improvisation. We ended up on stage together playing for 10 minutes for, during this party, which uh, Mervyn had, had, had organized. So Mervyn completely lost control of the party at that point, which doesn't <laughs> happen often. You know, he, he stays in control of most things. I came off stage after about 10 minutes, and he just turned to me and he said, Paul, you and I, we're going to start a business together. <laughs> right? That was it. You know, this sort of billionaire just said, we're going to start a business together. Come and see me in my office next week. And next, the next week, I was in his office with Ray, and he said, have you got a business plan? And we'd spent about two hours putting a business plan together on the back of a fag packet. And we went through the business plan. He said, hmm, that's interesting. How much do you need? And we kind of said, oh, um, uh, you know, half a million. He goes, yep, that's fine. What else do you need? And we went through a whole list of things that we needed. He goes, yeah, that's fine. Do it. Come back in a couple of weeks when you've set it up. That was back in October. Uh, in January, we launched with a party for 600 people. Uh, we are now Talent Bank, with a Q at the end, B-A-N-Q. Uh, we've already put on about 30 or 40 gigs. We're about to sign our first, first artist. We're a production company. We put on events for other people, but we also put on events for ourselves that we promote. And we're about to start signing some of our artists. We have a roster of about 50 amazing artists. Uh, we had a gig last night with four of them, um, and it's going great guns. So that's me. That's my third career very early stage, almost pre-revenue. We've actually started earning money, which is great. Um, but that's probably what I'll be doing mainly for the next few years. I'm still at Cafe Nero, two days a week, mainly music, but uh, probably seven days a week at Talent Bank, having a lot of fun. And uh, that was our opening party, 600 people watching this incredible band um, called Coffee Pot Drive, having, uh, having a big party. So that's where I am today. Uh, everything kind of happened almost by accident, but it happened. Um, I'm having a lot of fun. I, uh, I've just managed to get my... Um, I've got to show you. I'm very proud of this, actually. Look at that. <laughs> I, don't pay, I don't pay for transport anymore. <laughs> Brilliant. And on that note, I will open it up to any questions about anything whatsoever.
Lost the microphone, so you're just gonna have to put your hand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear. We can hear. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for the excellent presentation. One question about the street light. Yep. You say you had a million users. 1.5 million users. Yeah. About 1.2 million, what we'd call active users. Uh, how did does it happen then? Then having all these users, you run out of money. What was it? What could you have done? Uh, to prevent that. Wow! You, uh, you know, <laughs> how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm going to be, you know, and obviously all of this is under what they call Chatham House rules, so, you know, we're not going to talk about this later. But um, we had, um, we, we, we had a, um, a chief executive who was a brilliant founder and got the business going and got everything going, but he was completely uncommercial, right? And we should have brought in a commercial CEO much earlier. We actually, he, he, he actually resigned um, a year before we sold the business because he realized he couldn't do the job we wanted him to do. But by then it was too late. We actually, we actually recruited a new CEO who was completely commercial. And if he'd have had maybe six months more time, he could have started to turn dial up revenues because there are ways you can make money of course when you've got that number of users but we uh, we, we just didn't have time to do it um, I'm not, and maybe you know we couldn't have done it so next door who bought us they're very big in the states they've got um, millions and millions of users in the states and they are still pre-revenue as well which is incredible I mean basically if you're going to go into social networking you need to have incredibly deep pockets um, and, you know, unless you get to a massive scale, you're probably never, ever going to make money. That's the reality of it. So, you know, our users loved us. They thought we were the best thing. A lot of them, you know, used us every day. They thought it was amazing. But, you know, great. We couldn't survive. It's also changing a lot in the uh, 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 time was five, but now there's more revenue on the internet than before. All um, the advertisement is more... Uh, no, not well. Advertising. I mean, the kind of the, the old, the old original banner advertising went completely. Really, I mean, you cannot earn money from from that type of advertising. You know, it all has to be very cleverly now built into the, you know, in, in, into the the streams of of, of, of information that the, that the customers are using. And the idea was, I mean, the idea was is that we would become the ultimate sort of yellow local yellow pages, and local businesses would pay us to be in our directory, which we actually had set up, and then would pay to, to you know, be number one in the directory, if you like, because you know, plumbers found us an amazing um, way of, of finding customers. You know? So there's got to be money there. But the problem is, is that a lot of those businesses are, they don't, they don't understand marketing. You know? And I talk to a lot of plumbers about, uh, about would they spend money on you know, on street life and, and being part of the di directory. And a lot of them kind of go, oh, I don't know really, you know. Or they'd say, oh, my wife does that. Or, you know, it, it, it's very, very hard to monetize that type of a business. But, you know, I think we might have got there in the end, but we needed much, much deeper pockets. Yeah. Hiya. Um very interested to hear your journey there. And, Thank you. And um, my, my dad's done a very similar thing to the, the sort of concept of street life and failed in a similar kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, then on, now on TV you see things like jetofrade.com and mm -hmm. things like that. What, was, what do you think they did differently to, to yourself and my, and my father certainly? You know, yeah. Um. I mean, in, you know, checker trade is exactly what we were going to try and do, um, but obviously all online. Um, you know, they had a big advantage because they, uh, they were offline and they were a first mover pretty well. There were two or three, in, but I think, you know, they're, they're probably the biggest now. And um, they had a very clear value proposition for the, you know, whoever, the local tradespeople. And, um, you know, they, 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 
that they could persuade. It was much easier for them to persuade those tradespeople to spend money than, than we we did. And and I think that's partly maybe we were five years ahead of our time. You know, my guess is that in five or ten years' time, if we tried to do what we were doing a couple of years ago, it would be much easier because. You know, bluntly, it's a much younger group of people who are completely at ease in spending money on online marketing. But a lot of the people we talk to just wouldn't, wouldn't spend money. <coughs> so, you know, I think that's part of it. So when you were a ski instructor, why did you turn around and do an MBA? And why specifically that school? Was well, because, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm a reasonably sensible person. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I, as a ski instructor, it, it, it's an amazing job, and you meet brilliant people. But it, it is very seasonal, <laughs> you know. Or you have to go to Australia in, in the summer. And, and I, I know people have done it, but you know, it, it's one of those jobs where you, you see people kind of hanging around year after year after year, and it all gets a bit sad after a while, you know. And and I, and I actually I ended up I did a. I didn't talk about it. I did a season before university as well. Um, two seasons, I think, is, is a maximum you should do because then you kind of get locked into that life. And actually, it's not a very, it's not a very healthy life after a while. Um, and NCR, very, very simply, because though I'm not English at all. I, I sound English. But my background is completely not... My father um, was German. My, my mother was Austrian. My wife is French. I was brought up in this kind of massively multicultural society. Um, we're not Brexit people in my family. And, um, <laughs> and I, I, I went to a very English school, actually. Um, uh, but later on, as I was growing up, realized that I was kind of a bit different from some people who were you know, very English-English. And it was when I kind of looked at the school that I realized it, it, it had this incredible multiculturalism about it. Because it, it, you know, every, it, there are people there from all over the world. Um, it, it was just an environment that really suited me because of my background. And I, you know, and I actually, you know, as I walked into that school, in a way, for the first time in my life, I felt completely at home within that type of environment. Any more questions? Hi there, thanks very much. Uh, I'm in particularly interested in the scale-up phase. There seems to be an awful lot out in the marketplace about startups, entrepreneurship. It's great to get started. Yeah. I know this community very well, and I guess the digital agencies generally. You're looking at a lot of companies between about 10 and 20 people, and that's about as far as you can go by yourself. Yeah. So you bought into this coffee chain at five shops, around 35 to 40 people with you for joining as the management team. Yeah. I'd be interested to hear from you maybe your top sort of two to five pinnacle moments as you went from that size, getting your, your foundations right and your footing in the door, um, up to say that first 100, 500 people. Are there any standout moments for you where you thought that was kind of, we've really broken a glass ceiling here and we're getting into the next, the next phase? Um, I mean, there's the obvious sort of financial um, Fulcrum, you, you go over when you become self-funding, and that's you know a hugely important part of a business, where you're not reliant on outside funding in order to grow. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that when we started, we we thought you know we we would be at that point when we had about 15, and when we got to 15, we thought it was maybe 25, mm -hmm. and when we got to 25, we thought well maybe 40, and it you know. <laughs> because the problem is, is that when you're building a business, when you're scaling a business, you actually have to invest a lot in, in, in the center, you know, and bring in really good management. Um, so that was, you know, when we did get to that point, and I can't even remember, I think it was probably about 60 or 70 um, in the end. I mean, that was a very, very important point. Um, I... I the... I mean, the, physically, what happens is that you know, when you have when, when you have five shops, you can actually be every almost everywhere, you know, within a couple of days. And what we realised when we got to about fifteen is that you you have to delegate, you know, and that was quite a big point of when we really started bringing people that we could trust and delegate to. Um, and and uh, that was a big learning for us. I mean, a lot of the things I did was all about 
um, systemi systemizing everything and having processes in place and you know just getting something that you can scale up. I mean, scaling up is the hardest <coughs> thing. Um, it, it really is. Um, and and the real challenge for us was not losing our culture as we grew. And Jerry, the chairman, that's his mantra. It's all, always been, yeah, we're kind of a family business. And the reason people enjoy coming to Cafe Nero is because as you walk in, you know, we are different. You know, we're not Costa. Everyone tells me that. And I know, you know, I would say that, wouldn't I? But a lot of people realize that we are, there's something different about our teams and our staff. Um, and, and maintaining that sort of family culture, um, it is really, really difficult. And, and uh, you know, we've had to kind of invest huge amounts of, of time and money into doing that because, you, you know, the only way to do it is actually to bring people together, you know, quite a lot. That costs a huge amount. You know, when we, were, when we had 20 shops, you know, we would, you know, our annual conference would be this big. When, you, you know, now we have to... It's getting hard to find places that are big enough to take, you know, we, we, we're now, you know, if you, you think we've got 650 shops, 650 managers, you know, we're over a thousand people now when all the, you know, the, the kind of the managers and the head office come together. We're well over a thousand people. Um, and, and those are the kind of points that, um, you know, I don't think there's one point you, we really, I said, you, know, you kind of say, well, there's that. It doesn't go like, it sort of goes like that, but there are definite massive changes as you're scaling up. Um, and certainly um, when I meet um, entrepreneurs and uh, talk, I talk to a lot of small businesses and I look at a small, lot of small business plans, people looking for investment. The thing that they don't get is how much time, effort and money it takes to, to, to really scale up, uh, particularly in tech because they all believe it, it's going to be viral and it's not. It's never viral. <laughs> We'll go over there first. Yeah, right in front of you in the microphone. That's amazing. So, it's, uh, I, really, you know, I find it fascinating that a lot of the stuff you've done uh, over time has been very much community focused. Mm -hmm. It's all about community. That's right. Coffee's community, music's yep. community. Yep. I'm very passionate about my local music community as well. I do a lot of open mic stuff and Brilliant. supporting local unsigned artists. Yep. But as you know, the way that music's consumed now is very much throwaway, the way that Spotify works and is our application. It's, di it's different for different yeah. people, but yeah. on, on mass, you know, if you go generalize it. So how will Talent Bank differentiate itself from what's currently happening and what are the kind of goals that you're looking to work towards now? Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, I mean, first of all, our whole business philosophy is, is, is built around live, right? And you can make money from live music. I mean, live music is now one of the few places where it's quite clear, you know, there is a lot of money being made and will continue to be made. <coughs> and what we're seeing at the mar in, uh, in the market at the moment is live is actually growing again. Um, and so we, you know, we, we're already organizing gigs in the jazz cafe where we're, you know, we're selling 500 tickets at 10 pounds a piece, you know. It, it's not millions, but it, it's money, and the musicians are getting paid properly. So we believe if we build up that, yeah, you know, that can certainly pay the rent, you know. And then I think, you know, uh, you, the, the point about music, it's a bit like so many businesses now, um, because it's all gone online, and a number of things have happened. Is that one, the, the, the barriers to entry are much, much lower than they used to be. Anyone can make a brilliant EP, CD in their bedroom and they can sell it online and they can do all that for nothing, right? So the whole record company model, you know, where they would give the artist a, a, an advance of £20,000 and then they'd spend £200,000 making an LP and, you know, market, all of that is kind of finished, you know. But at the same time, so that has happened and that is having a big impact on the business. So that's great for the musicians, of course. Um, and it also means that the marketing channels or the monetization channels now are much, much more accessible because you can go and sell your music to, you know, to, to, to the ad advertising synchronization. You know, a lot of that's done online now. You just have to sign up. The, 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 the difficulty is still a bit about royalties 
and the way that, that that's built. And I've spent the last few weeks sitting in lawyers' offices and PRS, who are the main licensing body, trying to understand where the money comes in from licensing. And the answer is very complex. And I think they keep it complex, because the more complex it is, the harder it is for the musicians to understand, and the more money that the record labels take, because they do get it. They really do get it. And a bit of it now is about sort of breaking that down and for musicians to understand you know, how they can monetize. You know, merchandise, you can sell online now. Everything can, everything can be done online. Um, there are so many different ways now of earning money. And, and the reality is, what we're doing, so we're doing live, and part of, you know, by doing live, what it means is that the artists in our roster are automatically going to be seen and heard by a lot more people, which is amazing, because the thing that artists find unsigned artists is, is getting good gigs is really, really difficult. Um, and then the other thing we're doing is we're advising them on how to build their careers. So we're telling them, you've got to do that, you've got to do that, you've got to, you know. And so that's going to help them. And then finally, what we're doing, we're actually going to, act, I hate to word, use the word record label, but we will sign up some of the artists who we think are really going to go fast, and we will help to accelerate their career. Um, but we're doing it in such a way that we're not, we, we, we've got rid of all the um, old record com company contracts, and we're doing it as joint ventures. So we're setting up joint ventures with each artist, and it's 50-50, completely transparent, um, you know, and it, the record companies would probably shoot me if they knew what we were doing. So it's changing all the time, but there's still a long way to go, and I hope we're going to be part of that change. I like being disruptive. <laughs> right, I think we've got time for one more, one final question. One more question, maybe oh, yeah. a good one. Just do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll hang around afterwards a bit, you know, fine. <coughs> um, we spoke a lot about scaling up, about being first to market and having the market presence to make money. Going back to the early part of your speech, you were called Tom's, okay? Yeah. They had the scale, they had the products, they had the market. What went wrong with them? Wow. Um, <laughs> I mean, a combination of um, a lot of their market. So on the fibre side, you know, what's happened to the uh, manufacturing of clothing in, in, in the world all moved to Asia pretty well. Yeah. And they were they they just didn't respond to that. I mean if they were really smart they would have gone and built fibre companies all around Asia. They didn't. They kept going in Europe, you know, it, it was never gonna work. So that so I mean structurally they, they had some big, big issues there the way the market was moving. Um, and then they had some appalling management. I mean, really, really appalling. They made so many huge mistakes. They thought they could typically buy their way out of problems. They, they acquired a lot of companies. The, I, I, one of my jobs was analyzing the acquisitions that they'd made in one year. And out of 20 acquisitions, you know, 15 of them were complete disaster, beyond belief, you know. Um, and they had a chief executive who, while, while we were you know, losing huge amounts of money, or you know, certainly making far less than we had been, he was still you know, spending millions of pounds on his hobby, which was Formula One racing. <laughs> and he would move, go around the world seeing all the Formula One races, and we were putting a million pounds, you know, sponsoring one of the teams, because that's how, that's what, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well thank you very much, Paul. Thank you so much.